I want to test to make sure this is recording. It is. Um, I was still tweaking this lecture um, as late as 20 minutes ago, and so um, I haven't gotten to the glossary of Roman terms yet, but I will this afternoon, and I will put it up, post it up uh, on T-Square so you can access it. Um, I'm pretty far out of my um, knowledge area with this material. I have traveled in North Africa, and I have done work for the Aga Khan in the Middle East. Um, it's been a month, actually, in the West Bank, uh, near Jerusalem, uh, north of there, near Ramallah. But, um, but I think that uh, medieval cities in African Arabia, uh, aside from meeting um, certain accreditation criteria about global views, also um, makes an interesting comparison to, um, to European medieval cities. Many of these cities actually were, like Damascus, uh, cities of Roman origin or Hellenistic cities that were inaugurated as Damascus was as a Roman colonia. Um, and it makes a very interesting comparison. So that's really the nature of, of the underlying sort of point of today's lecture. The primary difference, which we will come back to at the very end, is that uh, cities in the Hellenistic and specifically in the Roman world, as you well know, were entirely block structures. Um, in the case of Roman cities, they were by and large orthogonal. As we saw a lot of times, this orthogonal geometry will in fact depart from its uh, 90 degree angle and will actually erode into uh, what Morris refers to as organic growth. Um, the second street type, and all cities that have streets are one or the other, um, is a dendritic pattern. Again, dendritic pattern means that you have dead end streets. And, um, and at some point, these streets will form blocks, but they become later what in the modern period will be referred to as a super block, uh, a, a very, very, very large block. Um, the difference, of course, is the nature of uh, the relationship in the hierarchy of streets. And that is that the dendritic pattern, like tree roots or like streams uh, of water, actually go from the largest river, uh, let's say um, the, in Georgia here in Atlanta would be the Chattahoochee, and then you would have a secondary stream like Peachtree Creek, and then it would be a, a tertiary stream like Clear Creek, et cetera, and then a dry drainage channel that would move into that. So it forms this pattern that looks like, uh, like tree roots. There are advantages and disadvantages to both of these systems. Uh, the Mesopotamian cities, of course, had dendritic patterns. The Egyptian cities had block patterns. Typically, we will see a block pattern at a point where there's a large degree of centralized um, political control, whether that's under a king or a a pharaoh or um, under a political association, a government of some sort. Um, the dendritic pattern tends to develop, interestingly enough, in, in the 20th century actually under governmental control because certain subdivision regulations tend to favor it. Uh, we will come to that toward the end of this course. But um, in their initial pattern, they, they, they were primarily a product of water supply. Um, and... Uh, that water supply that was combined with uh, a social organization that remained tribal, um, as many places in the world do today. Libya, for example, is still tribal. Egypt is not. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages here. The dendritic pattern tends to promote privacy. You have a tendency not to be able to, or you, you just, if you're in one of these cities, as we'll see in the Arabian Peninsula or in North Africa, uh, you would probably think more than twice about walking up into one of these tertiary streets. There's no barrier to prevent you from doing it, but it's pretty clear in the same way that in Atlanta today, if you were to walk across someone's front yard up to their front porch, it's pretty clear the front porch is not part of the public realm, right? It's part of the private realm. So uh, you don't use other people's front yards as uh, sort of public space. Um, 
And so the dendritic pattern tends to promote privacy toward the uh, tertiary toward the tertiary streets. There are certain uh, disadvantages, and the disadvantages are if you just imagine traffic of any kind, whether it's pedestrian or vehicular of some sort, could be a beluga wagon, you know, in the medieval world, or it could be an automobile. Moving through a block structure, actually, you have a lot of alternatives. You can sort of go from A to B, from the top of this diagram to the bottom of this diagram, in a wide variety of places because of the number of intersections, all of which connect. Whereas in the dendritic pattern, everybody that's at the end of one of those tertiary streets has to get out into the, um, uh, in order to go somewhere else, has to actually get out into the uh, secondary street. Uh, the other advantage that, uh, two advantages that block structures tend to have is one, they're easy to add to. Uh, we've seen that in cities like Athens, which were growing by a process of accretion. Um, the houses were irregular. Uh, you don't have the orthogonal geometries, but it's easy. There. It's a block structure, so you're easy, it's easy to kind of add another block. Um, whereas in the dendritic pattern, if you look at that and sort of say, where would I put the next street? It obviously has to be um, somewhere, somewhere down in here or somewhere up in here or somewhere over here because there's no place, no space in here where I can add an additional street. Um, and the final advantage is that if you have um, a need to, to sort of collectivize space for some reason, whether it's a market or a monumental building of some sort or a public building, a courthouse or even a public park, uh, which is a kind of public space that emerges in the industrial city in the 19th century, uh, it's easier to sort of make that public because it's bounded on all sides by streets. It's pretty clear when you go down Piedmont or you go down 10th Street here in Atlanta that Piedmont Park is open to everybody, right? Whereas uh, if you were in this dendritic pattern uh, and the public space or the collectively owned space, the shared space, is invisible from the secondary street, the only way you can actually access it is from one of these secondary streets. And that becomes, or there's, in some cases, we'll see in Sana'a and Yemen, there will actually be a gate or something here which allows uh, that, uh, allows access. So that's the underlying sort of difference, really, and the only real difference between medieval cities uh, in Europe and medieval cities in Africa and Arabia. But we'll go through, there are some other differences that tend to be not structural, but, uh, but uh, certainly um, symbolic. There are, um, this is uh, Marrakesh, which is in Morocco, northern Africa. And uh, what we're looking at is actually the uh, late 19th and early 20th century um, subdivisions here, which obviously form a block pattern and obviously were influenced by a European colonial power, in this case, France. Um, and by the way, uh, I should point out that um, most of these cities are in the Islamic world that there is no such thing as an Islamic city any more than there is such a thing as a Christian city, okay? But there are cities in the Christian world and there are cities in the Islamic world, and um, these uh, various uh, religions do play some role in, um, in, in how things are, uh, are, are built out, but, but less than one might actually think. The point I'm making here is that when we are going to move into medieval Marrakesh into the Medina, uh, we see a very different pattern. So um, this has to do more with time than it does with uh, any particular kind of cultural condition, right? That that's Marrakesh every bit as much as that is Marrakesh. Uh, the difference is it's easier to find your way around here than it is there. Um, if you imagine that you were a pizza delivery guy, you might have trouble in this world. Um, now, in the Medina, in um, Marrakesh, the old part of the city, oh, I should mention also that I'm using both um, the common era, that is AD time, and also um, AH time, which is the um, Muslim time, Islamic time. So uh, if we look at this, we see a pattern where we have these kind of primary streets, these very large streets. Now, large in this case means 14 feet wide, right? Uh, they're actually still pretty narrow. And um, very little, you'll see a few automobiles down here on the right side of the photograph, but you won't see cars up in here because there's no way to get a car in there, 
Uh, the same is true in Venice, by the way. If you if you break a leg in Venice, you're kind of in there, you know, unless you have access to a canal um, or something. You there's it's it's pretty it's a labyrinth back up in there. You'll also notice here that the house types are different in the sense that they all have these open courtyards. Um, that again is a Mediterranean, ancient Mediterranean house type, similar to the Roman house, similar to the um, uh, Greek house, similar to uh, the Megaron that actually goes way back into the Bronze Age. Now if we look at this pattern, what we see then is that there's a portion of this that branches off of that primary street into a kind of secondary passage which then moves back again into a tertiary, a tertiary system. And if we go back to Assur, uh, in the 14th century before the Common Era, we find, in fact, exactly the same structure, that we have a primary street out here, and there's a kind of secondary uh, street that comes here, and then finally it sort of dead ends into these entrances, which are shared here by a group of houses, all of whom have party walls. Um, this is was most likely, we have very little information about who lived here, but most likely we can assume that this was some sort of an extended family. And often what you will see at the end of one of these little cul-de-sac uh, conditions is some large extended family. Everybody that has a door that opens onto that street are essentially cousins, right? So we'll go back now and take a look at sort of how this is transferred um, into, uh, often embedded within uh, the pre-existing Roman or Hellenistic city in North Africa, a city like Marrakesh or a city like Fez, Morocco, which developed entirely after the Roman period, uh, this is the initial pattern. And we want to see in terms of process where that pattern comes from. This is likewise Ur, going all the way back to the third millennium uh, before the Common Era. And uh, you see exactly the, same, exactly the same pattern. Now, these patterns were then picked up by the... Um, Muslim expansion, which occurred very rapidly in the 7th and 8th centuries of the, of the Common Era, moving across out of the Arabian Peninsula, across North Africa and into Spain, as well as up into um, uh, areas of, of the former Yugoslavia and on up into parts of southern Russia and uh, across and eventually uh, further, to the, further to the east. Um, the cities that I want to, that I'll discuss today are these. Um, we will start, in fact, with Damascus, a, a Roman city, and see how that uh, block structure was eroded by the street pattern. And then we will look at Ghat, which was a way station uh, in the Sahara, halfway between Timbuktu and Cairo. That is a huge, di that's a distance from about New York to San Francisco. That is an enormous difference, distance. And um, Ghat was a, an oasis in the middle of a very inhospitable landscape, the Sahara, um, controlled by a group of people that we call Tuareg. That's not what they call themselves. They still exist. Uh, and for 2,500 years at least, they first appear in Herodotus, the Greek historian uh, who talks about them. They control the trade routes across the Sahara Desert. Uh, these people's way of life uh, are currently is currently... Um, we're watching the death of, of this culture, um, in part because no one ships a flat panel TV from Cairo to Timbuktu via camel. Uh, you know, with things like airplanes, uh, it's just too inefficient to do so. And uh, the Tuareg are left, unfortunately, without uh, a means of support because these trade routes are no longer, uh, in the modern uh, world of technology, no longer um, as valuable as they were for a very, very, very long period of time. Timbuktu is important because it was the, the, the furthest point north in the Mali Empire, which controlled um, the gold flow from this area of Africa up north and into Cairo and into the north. Uh, at one point in time, uh, Timbuktu, probably 40% of the world's gold supply passed through Timbuktu. It's literally in the middle of nowhere, and there's a colloquial saying in English that some of you are familiar with. It's a boy, I had to drive to Timbuktu, right? Or where does Jennifer live? Well, I don't know. She lives in Timbuktu. It just means a place that's really far away, and Timbuktu is really, in fact, very far away, but a fascinating place nonetheless. 
Um, Marrakesh, we've already seen. Fez, which I think is probably the most medieval city remaining. The old part of the city is probably the most medieval um, city remaining uh, in the world. Um, and um, Cairo to some degree, though not much. So we will, um, we will begin here, I think, with uh, Damascus. Now there's an old city that we see down here on the right, uh, which uh, predates uh, the Roman world. Uh, this area was conquered uh, by Pompey uh, in the first uh, middle of the first century uh, before the um, Common Era. And um, the city was eventually made a colonia, and it was inaugurated as a Roman city, but it had a sort of Greek underlay prior to that. Uh, again, we see the same pattern. If we look up here, we see a block structure. We see this sort of Baroque geometry, all of which we will come to later. But when we look down in here, we can still see, if we squint, sort of elements of this, uh, of a sort of Cardo decumanus like structure, insula, block structure. But um, as we'll see right, if I can find the pointer, as we see right here, we have, in fact, the erosion of that down into this cul-de-sac arrangement. Um, there's very little, actually, of the Roman world still remaining in Damascus. Um, you see it here, but also at one of the gates on the street called Strait, uh, called the Bab Shariki, Sharki Gate. And uh, this just gives you a, a very brief sort of uh, introduction to its long and distinguished history. And unfortunately, today, um, is being much of which is being destroyed by the Civil War, as is the city of Aleppo, an absolutely incredible Hellenistic city that um, is being bombed um, consistently. The old city then, um, where we sort of see the outline here of um, the, the Greek agora, of which nothing remains, and then here in the great mosque of Damascus, which began life actually as the Roman Forum, and then a hospital was built, and then um, a church, actually the Church of St. John, and then eventually converted uh, into a mosque. And we can see quite clearly these dashed lines which form the insula, of this Hellenistic city and then the extent to which uh, this has been eroded down into this uh, sort of secondary tertiary uh, dendritic pattern. So here's the street called Strait, the site of the Greek Agora. Um, that's what it looks like today. That's about the widest uh, space in it. And then the site of the, uh, of the Roman Forum. And then a medieval addition, which was the citadel first fortified in the 11th century of the Common Era uh, by the Turkmen warlord, uh, whose name I will not attempt to pronounce because I will screw it up. Um, so if we zoom in down on this lower quadrant there, we see again this erosion. Uh, some, of the, some of the streets remain, some of them are cut off, and then we see these little tertiary streets that are kind of coming back up into the middle of the block. So that does not connect to that. This what was a street has disappeared completely, built over, and so forth. Now, we see that kind of erosion in the medieval European world, but the block structure is retained. Um, in parts on the primary streets of um, these Hellenistic and Roman cities um, that actually were conquered uh, during the Islamic expansion, uh, we see again in the medieval period this sort of erosion from what was a sort of decumanus that we see here along the sidewalks and colonnade and shop fronts and so forth. Uh, where there are, in fact, erosions built out in front of that. So if we were to go to Jerusalem here, down the old Roman Cardo, whoops, down the old Roman Cardo, on the left is a part that has been excavated uh, in the last 30 years, and then uh, on the right is a part that still functions as the primary market structure of the old city. Uh, the alignment of that market is the Roman Cardo, and if we were to peel away all of those shop fronts and lift off uh, that barrel vault with a slight squinch arch that we see running over it, the covered part, we would have, in fact, what appears on the left. Um, the same thing. These uh, columns date to about the uh, 4th century uh, of the Common Era. Now, what is causing this process? I mentioned the uh, Tuareg, but I'll use them as an example. Um, the um, Muhammad was, of course, uh, a traitor, um, meaning that he uh, was employed, actually, by a woman who he eventually married, but who was older than he was, uh, who was in the basically the 
import-export business. And um, so there was a tradition of this kind of nomadic trading which occurred over very long distances in very arid environments, uh, the Arabian Peninsula, um, as well as the Sahara. And thus, the ac access to water uh, was absolutely uh, critical. Uh, these little natural oases, deep wells, and other things which, um, which were uh, critical to the success of, 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 of this world. Uh, the Tuareg, then, um, if we move down immediately to Timbuktu, we'll notice something here which has sort of uh, some pretense toward orthogonal architecture. And then we look down here and we see this settlement on the outskirts of the city. This is a Tuareg settlement. And if we go over here, what we see then are these little family compounds that are walled about. See, there's one. You can see them. They look like sort of um, paramecium or something, little cellular structures that sort of have a series of two, three, four huts. This is uh, a sort of equivalent of a pater familias with uh, the eldest son, perhaps his wife, uh, the second son, or perhaps a daughter whose husband died or something, and they're living in this little walled family compound. Now, these people are traders, so you did not need agricultural territory, uh, which was fortunate because there's not very much that's going to grow um, in this kind of arid environment. Um, but that is a pattern. This pattern that we see right here is very ancient. And if we go to Ghat, in the center of an abandoned city now, which was one of these way stations, um, it's in Libya, but in the Libyan desert, part of the Sahara, uh, we notice that these have now developed into these kind of familial compounds, like we see this large one here. And then you'll notice this gap, this kind of space in between, a kind of no man's land, where um, um, these, this family over here might, in fact, be of a different tribe than this family or a different clan, a different extended family. And like the medieval cities of Europe, at San Gimignano, for example, uh, that had these kind of defensive towers, you have a kind of no man's land in between, these sort of gaps which um, ultimately are sort of um, separating um, competing uses, a buffer, in other words, competing families. Now, in terms of process, if we go back to Rome and we look at the river crossing down here, and we recall that on the Quirinal and the Viminal and the Esquiline, we had Sabine tribes, and on the Palatine, uh, the Aventine, and possibly the Capitoline, we had uh, Latin tribes, and this river crossing that was very important in the salt trade, and that over some period of time, according to the myths, it happened in a very short period of time. My guess is it happened over hundreds of years. These two groups grew together uh, in a process that uh, is known as Sinoicism, Sinoicism, joining together. And um, probably because it was in their mutual interest, they um, said, well, you know, if the Latin tribes control the river crossing, but you have to pass the salt through um, Sabine territory to get to the wealthier parts up north in, um, in Etruria, in the Etruscan cities, um, it's in our mutual interest to somehow join together. And whatever the actual story is about them joining together, we know from the material record as well as from the literature that they actually did, forming this political association and creating a city called Rome, which was based not on an ethnic group, uh, but rather uh, from the get-go on, on this conjoining of different tribal units into a single, into a single political entity. Um, so we see that here in, in some detail, and I want to then move back to a hypothetical condition um, where we would have, let's say we're in uh, Morocco somewhere, uh, and we would have a river. A river is very important. Not only is it a source of water, it's also a source of um, some source of transport. And uh, getting across that river, just like it was on the Tiber, is fairly important. If you could control the river crossing, you could exact a toll, you could charge people, you know, I'll have two skins uh, for, you know, you crossing the river sort of thing, um, sort of like Georgia 400. <laughs> um, and, um, and let's assume that there was a family that controlled that. Uh, that this was a large family, an extended family, um, using Aristotle's sort of build up of uh, the state, uh, beginning with the family and then beginning with the extended family and then eventually forming the village and so forth. And let's assume further that um, 
over time, again, the eldest son and then the second son and so forth, um, eventually different groups come for different reasons, families intermarry, and there are these large extended families that grow into uh, tribes or grow into clans. And let's assume further that what we have are wadis, W-A-D-I, which are dry creeks in which during the brief periods of intense rain that do fall, in fact, um, wash all the sewage and the effluent and so forth out into, uh, into the river. So your water supply needs to come in upriver where it's clean, um, either through an impoundment or in some cases uh, there might be a deep well or something within that walled enclosure or a cistern that could catch uh, ro roof water. But in general, you were dependent not upon what fell out of the sky uh, in this environment. You were dependent upon something that was underground or something you could capture from an existing uh, stream or a natural oasis. Um, so the effluent is moving along the red lines and the water in is moving along the blue lines. And let's assume further that this Sinoicism doesn't happen. For whatever reason, Rome, as I said, was unique in the ancient world. Uh, it didn't happen that way in other places. And um, they were not derived from a single ethnic origin of some sort. But let's assume here that that Sinoicism does not happen. And then over time, the head of the family, the head of the tribe, uh, with the elders of the other families, actually then begin, as the place begins to grow, they begin to parcel out to um, their second, third, fourth generations and so forth, various plots where they can, in fact, build houses. And with that, the freshwater supply is extended. And it, since it's shared, then that freshwater um, becomes, in fact, a, 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 in a street. So the street begins to uh, follow, in fact, the pattern of the water supply. Likewise, let's assume that the uh, wadi, uh, the effluent going out, uh, of the, you know, is actually likewise some collective, like any sewer is, a kind of collective uh, uh, structure. And uh, thus, you've got to have the fresh water in and the dirty water out. So over time, this begins to densify as people begin to build uh, various houses, these sort of compounds like we see in the photograph above. And eventually, a village is formed. And this begins to extrapolate out into a town. And if we'll notice then where the streets are, the streets are following both the sewer and the water. And in Sana'a's, we'll see they're actually running parallel to one another. It's a very elaborate Sana'a's in Yemen, uh, South Yemen, and um, a very elaborate, a very elaborate pattern uh, with a whole series of rules that, uh, that apply to um, the use of water and so forth. And so if we write that large, what we get is, in fact, Fez, Morocco, where we see up here at the top a sort of impoundment, which is uh, water supply coming into the, to the upper part here. We see a similar impoundment here, which is water supply here. And then south of that impoundment, just like um, in Atlanta, where south of Peachtree Creek, it's grossly polluted because of the effluent going into the Chattahoochee, whereas north of the sewer outfall, you have clean water, and the pumping stations are north of the sewer outfall. Same thing. Rivers, it turns out, are very good places to put human waste because of the turbulence in the water. The problem is when you get very large populations, um, the oxygenation process doesn't occur, and so you begin to get E. coli bacteria, anaerobic bacteria, which is harmful uh, to human health. And we'll see as cities grow in the 19th century, this was their public health was their primary problem. These places solved that to a substantial degree by this elaborate pattern of um, fresh water in and dirty water out. Now, keep in mind that if you go outside Fez or you go to the newer parts of any city in Morocco, you won't have this same pattern. You will have a block structure. Um, it's very, very different. So here we're talking about the medieval part of these cities, which goes back to uh, about the 11th century, about 1,000 years ago, um, and um, uh, was really two cities uh, that developed on either side of the river uh, with a series of important river crossings. In fact, very few. You can see one right there. You can see another one right here. And if you come down here, you don't see very much um, in the way. That's actually a kind of open space. 
But these sort of neighborhoods that we see, or dar, uh, these developed initially out of these large extended sort of familial, familial compounds with this elaborate control of water systems. Now, once Islam comes in, the mosque will tend to take over um, the control of that um, as a kind of collective structure. And uh, as we'll see in Sana'a, that also happens with gardens that are in public spaces that are in behind this tertiary system of sort of cul-de-sacs. This is what it actually looks like. I have been there. It is the most remarkable, uh, wow. I mean, you can really get lost. If you're not in there with a guide, uh, it's very, very easy to get lost in there. And the widest streets, no automobiles, the widest streets, about 12 to 14 feet. And um, the streets, like the medieval European cities, will have very few facades. The only articulation of facades will actually be on a madrasa, which is a school attached to a mosque, or on the mosque itself. And typically, this will have either striping. In Egypt, it would be striped. In um, Morocco, it would be a carved cedar wood filigreed door, very elaborate, that would then open into a courtyard. Uh, because the Carowin um, Mosque is, in fact, um, still very active as an infidel, I was not allowed in, but I was able to get into the school, into the madrasa, so I'll show you sort of some of that later. So this is what that main street would look like. We see the mosque here with the minaret. This is the... Um, North African version of a minaret uh, for the call to prayer. And then you'll notice that there are very few elaborated, articulated facades, exactly like what we would see in a medieval European city built roughly at the same time. Uh, on the lower, um, the lower part here, this is the interior courtyard. So don't be fooled by this, because if you go in there, this is what it looks like inside, right? So once you get into these residential compounds, you have very elaborate, very beautiful houses uh, on, the, on the interior opening into these courtyards. Um, very modern in many cases. Uh, gorgeous, in fact. And still quiet um, because all of, the, all the sewage and all of the animals and the sheep, and <laughs> all of that is on the outside, out in the streets. And you are actually inside this uh, very sort of private world, a uh, family world on the inside. Sana'a, one of the most remarkable cities um, uh, in existence, actually, with these incredible uh, 10th, 10th uh, century, 11th century towers, that uh, residential structures that, that rise up in some cases as many as 10 floors, um, which we'll see in some detail later in the course. Um, again, you actually had sort of two cities, but if we go in and sort of look at this part that we see right here, uh, you'll notice a citadel over here on the right. It's all walled about. We have a wall and gate. Um, thus, we have a fortified castle and keep. Um, we have market, very elaborate, in this case, very elaborate market structure. And we get into these large kind of super block conditions with these interior, um, interior sort of gardens that are um, controlled by the, 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 the masjid, controlled by the mosque. These are those houses. They are, of course, UNESCO World Heritage. Uh, I hope that nothing ever happens here that would destroy these. They are unique in, in the world. Um, and um, you, there, we'll go into some detail, but just so you're not left hanging. Animals go on the ground floor. This is a reception room. Uh, the grandfather's room, the head of the house, is at the, the very top. Uh, the bathroom is on the top. The actual effluent runs down the sides of the buildings and into pits that are then kept where the liquid is separated. Uh, you then retrieve the night soil, the um, solid material from the effluent, and you use that as human fertilizer. You use that actually in the market gardens. And you say, ew, human fertilizer, but um, I don't know why we don't do more of that because um, actually the city of Milwaukee sells theirs. It's called Mill Organite, and it's used in golf courses. So if any of you play golf, the next time you um, hit a nine iron out of the fairway and that little sort of uh, brown sort of pellets come flying up along with the divot, that's human fertilizer. Uh, but it's clean. Uh, you can hold it in your hand, and uh, it is very, very rich in nitrogen and is able to actually fix the nitrogen in the soil. I don't know why we just flush it down and don't do anything with it. Um, 
Well, there's a lesson here. Uh, sometimes the modern world gives us great things, and sometimes it really screws things up. Not always either or. Um, this was a case where when the World Health Organization came in here about 25 years ago, Yemen had been closed to the outside world for a very long period of time. And um, finally, the South Yemen uh, opened up. North Yemen did not initially. South Yemen, uh, two separate countries like North and South Korea. South Yemen opened up uh, to the West, and uh, Ronald Lukak, who held the Aga Khan chair, at MIT and who taught at Georgia Tech for 16 years was part of a team that went in there and he begged with them not to do this, but they were convinced the public health community that this uh, affluent arrangement was unsanitary and thus it needed to be contained in pipes and so they made them put everything in these pipes coming down the sides of the buildings and of course that created a disaster because the bacteria, the anaerobic bacteria stayed anaerobic. It never was exposed to oxygen and therefore it never converted into aerobic bacteria, non-harmful, right? Um, so they had to go back in after about 10 years of uh, real problems and rip all these pipes out and go back to the system that, of course, they had figured out a 1,000 years ago. Anyway, kind of a cautionary tale. Now, in these streets, if we see the primary street here in Sana'a on the left, um, again, no automobiles, and then a secondary street that we see on the right, and then here we see a, a little the entrance to one of these kind of tertiary compounds, which we'll go into here in detail. This is what that would have looked like, and here you see three houses, one, two, three, all of which have entrances into off of this little cul-de-sac street. <coughs> Thus, well, this is what I was talking about. If you were walking down the secondary street here on the right, and you looked back up in there, you would think twice about going in there because there's something about it that signals this is not available to the public. Like I was talking about in your front yard or your front porch, you sort of something about it signals that this is not sort of public space, whereas the left and the right are. And um, they, they're they accessible, but um, you just sort of have a, you would think, as I said, more than twice about going back up in there. So if we look down... At uh, Asur on the lower left, we see a very similar pattern here uh, where we have clusters of housing uh, identifying 18 different houses showing that cluster and then the street pattern and the entrances to those properties. Now, that is actually following the water supply. So you have two things. You have familial or tribal ownership, extended families, and then you have this water supply, both of effluent and of um, water, clean water coming in. Um, this is what one of those tertiary streets looks like. And then on the right, this photograph I just liked a lot, so I scanned it. It was in National Geographic magazine uh, in Fez showing the sort of um, um, semi-public or shared space between three of these houses. These children are all probably cousins um, living up in there. I think it would be a wonderful place to live. You could imagine all your cousins and so forth up in there uh, playing. Um, in Jeddah, because of the intense heat, a lot of these were actually covered over. This is actually, there's not much of this left, but this is in the historical core here in Saudi Arabia. And um, a partial covering here of this tertiary street. But again, notice very few articulated facades of any, of any sort. If we go back to Sana'a, um, we notice all of this greenery, all of this sort of um, natural greenery, that, uh, these gardens that we see here and here, and here, but if you're walking down this street and then up into one of those secondary streets and into a tertiary street, you would have no idea that this is back there. You can't see it. You have to get up in an airplane or up in a tower or something to look down and sort of um, see that, in fact, you, are, you have these very elaborate gardens. These are controlled, in fact, by the mosque, by the... Um, by the the rulers of, of the religious institutions, which act like a sort of glue that holds this tribal relationship together. Uh, this is what they look like when you do get into them, and um, various people apparently have um, are allotted certain plots, and uh, these are then sold in the marketplace. This is very ancient, and of course, in time of attack, um, everybody could move into the citadel, but you still would have some 
behind the wall some, some agricultural land that you could produce food on. Well, that citadel, as we see here um, in Sana'a, up on the upper right, uh, sort of on a high defensible point, slightly better photograph of it that we see here. And um, this actually goes all the way back to, um, to about the 10th century of the Common Era. Now, if we go to Ghat, a, a city that I mentioned this, just showing here the trade routes, um, these, were, these were really uh, extraordinary. So if you look at the distance here from Cairo to Timbuktu, um, you'll and sort of compare that length here. It's roughly from Spain to Turkey. I mean, it's a really, really long way. And um, the uh, red that you see here are, are parts that are Christian, and, the, and this are sort of parts that remain uh, Islamic. Uh, Got was this point that we see right here, and it's very old. There we see the primarily gold trade in the Middle Ages, which was moving both north across the Sahara and, um, and across to Cairo. In fact, there was a, a depression because of the amount of gold, an economic depression because of the amount of gold that flowed into Cairo uh, in about the 13th, 14th centuries um, of the Common Era. Ghat is in the middle of the desert. It is a natural oasis, eventually abandoned. I think there's a small military base there now of some sort, communications tower. And if we go into the uh, core of the historical city, which goes way back, a couple of thousand years, um, we actually, again, see that same sort of pattern that we saw in Asur, that same pattern that we saw in Ur, as well as in Fez, uh, Fez Morocco. Well, Ghat, as I said, was the way station here for Timbuktu, which was on the edge of the um, Sahara headed south, and thus the last sort of point of embarkation out across the Sahara. Uh, there was a great empire here that developed in West Africa, the Mali in Mali, uh, which uh, was ruled by Mansa Musa, who was actually the grand nephew, nephew of the founder uh, of this empire, Sundiata Keita. And um, it was the source of almost half the world's gold supply. Absolutely astonishing. They became very wealthy, and it became a center of learning. He established um, um, a series of, of, of universities there uh, that became quite famous. These texts that go back to this period are actually in jeopardy right now. A group of people, Tuareg people, who no longer have employment, uh, have joined... Um, some of the branches of Al-Qaeda, and they actually believe that this ancient university and some of these texts are blasphemous for some reason, and so they, there's a door there that, you know, is only supposed to be opened at the end of the world, and they broke this door open, I guess, trying to foment the end of the world. It's really tragic um, in every sense. Uh, UNESCO and others are doing what they can to try to save these, these uh, Mali, the uh, world was ethnically diverse. Uh, it was not a single ethnic group by any means. And um, we see here, in fact, the Tuareg uh, consisted of a northern tribe and a southern tribe. Their language is Berber. It's an Afro-Asiatic language, but it is not um, Semitic, nor is it uh, any of the sub-Saharan African languages. Their mitochondrial DNA appears that they came from the area originally of uh, Somalia, of the Horn, the eastern part of Africa, and they look very different. The northern tribe tends to have lighter skin, lighter eyes. The southern tribe tends to uh, have darker skin and so forth. They're very, very colorful people. They lit up the desert like a flame for 2,000 years, and their way of life is disappearing, probably in your, your generation. It's really extraordinary. There we see them at the edge of the modern city of Timbuktu. There is the compound, and we can begin to see that village formation that I was describing earlier in Ghat. You can sort of see it in evidence right here. This is what it looks like from the edge of Timbuktu, which uh, was probably founded by the Tuareg, actually, as a trading, trading post before it was subsumed within the uh, Mali Empire in the thir around the 13th, uh, 12th century. So you notice the desert all around it. Uh, this is Timbuktu. And if we go into the core of Timbuktu, this map, this German map, uh, where we actually see Senkore, we see the names of these tribal units as they join together here in a process of Sinoicism, uh, 
that actually form the core of the city here of Timbuktu with a market, uh, where the market does not develop in, in the European medieval city until fairly late, until post-12th century. Um, actually, markets uh, appear much earlier uh, because of the trade and so forth uh, across and between these long distances and the sort of uh, core of, of nomadic existence by a lot of these people. Um, markets and trade was much sooner, much more important. It is probably of Berber origin that, that um, sort of uh, people that live in the Atlas Mountains and so forth. And um, as I said, they're not speaking uh, Semitic nor an Indo-European language. There we see the core then of that city with the Senkori Mosque that we see up here uh, on the north. And then this market building down here. Actually, his map is not all that bad. Uh, if we zoom in on that, what we see again is that same structure, these long kind of super blocks. We have primary streets, we have secondary streets, and then we have these little tertiary streets that dead end up into the core of these larger kind of blocks. This is actually the site of the madrasa or the school with this famous university that developed under Mansa Musa. And the open area served as market functions under the control of the mosque. This is what it looks like. Um, very old, uh, really quite extraordinary with this unique uh, form of architecture. These are some of the manuscripts that are in jeopardy. Many of them were destroyed partially by neglect, partially by European colonialism, partially uh, by internal strife. Um, and uh, there's a serious effort now to try to preserve these astronomical tables um, uh, which are quite extraordinary and very, very, very old. I mean, there's nothing equivalent to this in the medieval European world at the same time. Nothing. Uh, further, uh, I cannot pronounce this word properly, but uh, Degene, which is another um, one of the oldest, it's actually the oldest known city in sub-Saharan Africa, founded between 850 and 1200 of the Common Era um, by Sun, uh, Suninke merchants. Uh, it served as a trading post between the traders from the western and central Sudan and those from Guinea and was directed, um, directly linked to the important trading city of Timbuktu. So um, just to see how colorful these market areas actually are, um, this produce being produced in, um, in uh, these market gardens, similar to what we saw in Sana'a. This actually is uh, Timbuktu, but it could be Sana'a, very similar. So um, if we uh, actually sort of peel this back and zoom out to about 30,000 feet uh, and compare the medieval city in, in the um, Africa and Arabia, in the Islamic world, and we compare that to the medieval city in Europe, in the Christian world, uh, we notice remarkable similarities. Um, the wall and gate, they both have them. The citadel, castle and keep, they both have them. The mosque or the church in Parvi, they both have them. Market. Yes. Agricultural land? Yes. What's the difference, the primary difference? Street pattern. And that street pattern is, um, is very ancient. There we see uh, that quadrant of uh, uh, Rabad is what it's called in actually um, the neighborhood Rabad uh, in Damascus, which um, you can still see the remnants of that block structure, but then you can see how it's jostled around. And if we zoom in and overlay on top of that um, the actual pattern of the streets, we see then how that block structure is eroded into this cul-de-sac uh, dendritic pattern. And if we compare that to Rome, what we see is a similar sort of jostling, a similar departure, a similar move away from these Roman block structures that we still see traces of here and there. But, um, but the way in which uh, these streets uh, form, again, what Morris refers to as an organic pattern. Um, but every one of these streets forms a block, every single one of them, not a single dead end in the entire thing. Otherwise, uh, we're looking at uh, phenomena that are structurally very similar in the medieval world uh, between um, the cities in Europe and those in Africa and Arabia. Are there any questions? Find that interesting? I think so, too. It's a shame many of these parts of the world are currently not places that 
you would want to go, uh, particularly in Syria. But uh, these cities are absolutely fantastic. And uh, I hope in your lifetime you have an opportunity to experience at least one or two of them. No questions at all? No questions about the test? No questions about anything? All right. Well, we'll see you then on Friday. Okay? <laughs>